2 Corinthians for uh, beginners. This is uh, the fourth lesson in the series, Apostolic Ministry. We're going to cover 2 Corinthians chapter 2 all the way to chapter 7. A lot of reading today, so I encourage you to have your Bibles out uh, so that we can uh, read along uh, together. Uh, last uh, week we talked about the apostolic explanation regarding the accusation that Paul was being fickle and insincere because he had changed his travel plans without advising the, uh, the people at Corinth, without advising the church there. And uh, briefly I explained to you that he had uh, interrupted, uh, or excuse me, he had intended to visit uh, the Corinthian church uh, first in his travel plans. But when he heard of uh, trouble there, he wrote a letter and gave them a revised travel plan which would delay his coming. Um, we find out that they changed their behavior um, based on the letter that they received from him. Uh, but they found out about his original plan, his original travel plan, and then accused him, uh, accused him of insincerity. Uh, he writes then a second letter and describes his original plan, but explains that his change of uh, travel plans was done in order to give them time to respond to his letter. So he was going to go, found out that there was trouble in that church, he writes to them, you know, 1 Corinthians, exhorting them, reprimanding them, and instead of going to you know, visiting them right away, as was his original plan, he holds back to see what will be the result of the letter? How will they respond to my letter? And so um, he reminds them of his work among them, which was, a, uh, which was above reproach, and the fact that as an apostle of Jesus, you know, he's not insincere, and his work and the miracles that he's performed are a confirmation of this. God doesn't send somebody who's you know, insincere and hypocritical to go and do miracles and to speak the word of God. So at this point in the letter, he's going to leave off the explanation and move towards a description of his ministry and a comparison of his ministry to that of the false teachers who have come among them and uh, we, we get the sense that they're the ones that are kind of promoting this negativity within the church concerning Paul. So he explains himself, he tells them, uh, I didn't go when, when planned because I wanted to see how you would react to my letter. I was you know, giving you time. Um, and now he's going to address the, actually the main issue and that is the teachers who have crept into this uh, congregation and started uh, undermining his authority and his teaching. So we pick it up in uh, chapter two, beginning in verse 12. He writes, Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. So here, in addition to not wanting to hurt them with an early arrival, an early visit, he explains that he was also looking for his young assistant, Titus, and he traveled through Macedonia looking for him. Could you, you know, in these days, you know, we call somebody and say, hey, have you seen Titus? Let me call a couple of congregations and find out. Or we, we, we send Titus an email or we, you know, we do that. In those days, there was none of this. If you couldn't find him, you had to go look for him in, in person and that's what he does. And of course, this is another example of the suffering he experienced as an apostle. Remember in the previous letter, he was talking about you know, the, the suffering that he goes through as an apostle for various reasons, well, this is another reason for suffering. The fact that he was anxious, the anxiety that he felt for the welfare of his fellow workers. We continue in verse uh, 14. He says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved 
and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the, in the sight of God. So here he kind of builds a bridge in order to, uh, to compare the ministry, his own ministry with the ministry of these false teachers. A beautiful imagery here and a comparison based on Greek ideas and culture. The Greek games, remember when we first studied a little bit of the geography, the Isthmus, the Isthmus games, based on the location of uh, Corinth, second only to the uh, uh, Olympian, uh, Olymp uh, Olympic games. And so in the Greek games, you would see the winners wear a, a, raw, a laurel wreath that was scented. And uh, so the winner would run through the crowd or through the around the track and take, uh, as we call today, a victory lap. And the idea is that the, 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 the crown, the wreath that he was wearing, the, the, per, the winner was wearing, had a scent to it. You know, the smell of success, the smell of, of victory, if you wish. So Paul uses this familiar imagery to describe the ministry of the apostles. He says, God leads them everywhere to show the victory of Christ and the gospel, as well as their lives, all of these things, he says, are, are like an aroma that people are aware of when they come in contact with the apostles. For those, and he makes a, you know, a comparison, he says for those who accept the gospel, that aroma of Christ, that good news of the gospel, the, the lives and the work of the apostles, all of these things create an aroma, a, a, a sweet aroma because uh, the gospel and the apostles are talking about forgiveness and joy and fellowship and love and eternal life. You know, that aroma is sweet to those who believe. But for those who reject the gospel, the aroma is of death because it speaks of condemnation and suffering and disobedience and, suffering and separation rather from God. So Paul is able to accomplish several things with this one passage. First of all, he describes in Greek terms the effort of the gospel, the effect rather, of the gospel on believers and non-believers. He also describes the kind of life and influence that the apostles have wherever they go. And he encourages the brethren to a lifestyle that is, you know, that is that is compliant to the image of the aroma of Christ. If this is what we do, he says, if this is the effect that we as apostles have wherever we go, then you also have to have or should have this effect, this aroma. Your own lives should have this kind of aroma for those that come in contact with you. And he also sets the stage for a comparison of his ministry and teaching against that of the teachers there in Corinth that are causing the trouble. And so we pick it up again, this time in chapter, um, in chapter three. The first comparison he makes is this, the ministry of law versus the ministry of the spirit. The first comparison he makes, as I say, is that his ministry is that of and by the Holy Spirit and their ministry is of the law. So in verse six he says, um, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter here is the letter of the law. So he says our ministry, right, that we are administering, if you wish, is not of the letter of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, right? The law, what does the law bring? It brings death. It brings to us the knowledge of sin and death, he says. So for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
What does the Spirit do within us? What, what is the, some people say, you know, you know so I, I, I received the Holy Spirit when I was baptized, but I mean, I can't do any miracles and I can't speak in tongues and I, you know, I don't have you know, special knowledge through the Spirit other than what I learned in the Word. You know, exactly what does the Spirit do for me? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 8 that if the Spirit that is in Christ is in you, then the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will raise you from the dead. That's why it's important to have the Holy Spirit, not to perform miracles or do those things. Those days are past. No, it's important to have the Spirit of God within us because it's through the power of that Spirit that we'll raise from the dead. And that's what he's talking about here. So he says they're preaching that you need to be, you know, the false teacher, he says they're preaching that you need to be circumcised before you can become a Christian. These are ceremonies and duties that belong to Moses and the law. Paul is preaching the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of the Holy Spirit that gives life and renewal. Paul is administering the substance, the power. These other teachers were only talking about the forms, the rules, the traditions. These things never had the ability to give anyone any power. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, it was very ornate, it was very elaborate, the sacrificial system, the temple, all of that, the, the priests, it was all very grand. It was all awe-inspiring, if, if, if one could see it. But it didn't give anybody any, no one received forgiveness. Forgiveness was just you know, booted down the road until Jesus came. Nobody, nobody ever went to the temple and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those things that occurred in the Old Testament were merely you know, a shadow of the things to come. They were merely a preview of the things to come. They were the, they were the form, but they weren't the substance. And Paul is saying, these teachers, they're teaching you the forms all over again. I'm, I'm teaching you the substance. I'm giving you the power that these things only spoke of. And so their ministry of the law and Moses is incomplete, he says, without Christ. Let's read verse 15. He says, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil is over their hearts. His ministry is the final work of God, beginning with Moses, but finished by Christ and resulting not in more law, circumcision, food laws, special days. That's not why Christ came, to give us more rules. Christ came to give us freedom. He came to free us from sin and all of these things. In verse 17 and 18, he says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Their ministry did nothing to improve their lives, meaning their ministry, these false teachers. Their ministry did nothing to improve the lives of the Corinthians. His ministry brought them freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the curse of sin. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from death. His ministry brought them that and gave them the power to be transformed into the image of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. The law could never do that. The law could never make me want to do what is right. That was the weakness of the law. The law was there simply to point out what you did wrong. The commandments, what, what were they there for? To make you a better person? Of course not. The commandments were there to show you you're a sinner. <laughs> the laws were there to show you 
You're failing before God. The difference between you and God, the difference between you and perfection. The, the, the law never gave you any power. The law never gave an individual the thirst to do what is right and good. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God gives the believer a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. I know I can't be perfect, but I want to be. I know I can't you know, be exactly like Jesus was in all of the situations, you know, turn the other cheek and be patient and, and bear suffering without uh, anger and, and the desire for revenge. You know, I, I see how Jesus is and I want to be like, and even though I know I, I can't be like Him, I want to be like Him. That's the work of the Spirit in me. The law, on the other hand, never gave me that kind of desire. The law never gave anyone the thirst to do what is right. The law gave one a sense of angst, a sense of incompleteness, a sense of yearning, waiting for the day to be finally released. And it's Christ who finally came to release us, to satisfy this. Well, what does he say? Blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. What will happen to those people? They'll be satisfied. That's what Christianity does. My hope is that my hunger and thirst to be like Christ is finally going to be satisfied one day. When this old sinful body finally you know, falls away and I'm finally free to be in that glorious body that will enable me to be like Him as much as I have wanted it but couldn't have it in this fleshly body. The law never gave anybody that desire or that hope. That's what he's arguing here. Why, why are you going back to you know, laws and rules and why are you doing that for? You're going backwards. He also says in comparison that his ministry is right there out in the open. He's not sneaking around you know, trying to get his ideas behind people's back. No, my ministry is out in the open. Chapter four, he says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. These other teachers were crafty and they spoke behind Paul's back trying to destroy him. Paul carries on his ministry out in the open before all men and God with a good conscience. That's what he says. Whenever the gospel is hidden, it is so because of the sin of men, not because he hides it. It's not his fault some people don't believe. They don't believe because they'd rather stay in sin. They'd rather stay in the darkness. That's why they don't believe. That's why the gospel is, quote, hidden from them. It's not yet that God is hiding it and doesn't want them to have it. It's that they hide themselves in the darkness. Another comparison he makes. He said his ministry causes persecution. Let's read what he says about that. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, 
persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but, through, uh, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He doesn't say it here, but the implication is that these false teachers have never really suffered any persecution because of their message. They cause persecution, but they don't receive any persecution. Paul describes at length his own unworthiness to preach the message and the suffering that he has endured to do this ministry which these others have not experienced. You know, how do you know the legitimacy of the teachers? Well, this group of teachers are never persecuted and avoid all persecution. This teacher over here has been you know, beaten and whipped and imprisoned and nearly killed you know, for preaching the message and continues to do so. Which one of these guys do you think is sincere? Paul always has this comparison of the quality of his ministry with the false teachers in view. But he makes other points along the way as well. For example, the suffering of the ministry is destroying his body, he says, but the suffering is also making his spirit much stronger. Have you ever suffered for Christ? Have you ever been rejected because of your faith? Have you ever been slighted or undercut because of your belief? Have you ever been left out because you believe and people don't want to be with you? That hurts. But when you think about it and when you pray about it, aren't you rejoicing that you have been given the privilege of suffering a small part of what Christ suffered? Paul says also, all ministries will be judged. All ministries and ministers will be judged. He says, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, uh, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. A pledge, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a pledge, it's a guarantee that when the time comes, we will be resurrected. Imagine if the gospel says, you know what? You, 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 you repent, you're baptized, and uh, don't worry about it. You know, uh, I'll, I'll give you the spirit down the road 50 years from now. But God says, no, you come to me now. I'll give you the spirit now. You, you're guaranteed, you have the spirit. If you're in Christ, you have the spirit. If you die now, that spirit will resurrect you when the Lord comes. If you die 50 years from now, that spirit will resurrect you when the Lord comes. That's the, that's the pledge, he continues. He says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. 
for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So Paul uses this idea uh, that his body is decaying as a bridge to build his next idea that he is anxious for the final outcome of death to materialize and uh, his eternal life uh, uh, begin uh, with God. But he uses this idea to remind them of the fact that along with death comes judgment and everyone will be judged according to what they have done or not done. Again, the implicit suggestion is that he looks forward to this time because his works and his ministry are legitimate and good, but his detractors may not be able to say the same thing about their ministry. Yes, he's saying, you may be succeeding now, you may be undercutting me now, you may be having some success in drawing the, the brethren after yourselves with the teaching, but the, the day is going to come when all of us will be judged and our ministries will be judged and then we'll see who had the legitimate ministry. Then we'll see who are from God and who are not from God. Another thing or another comparison he makes, he says his ministry uh, is one of reconciliation with God. That's what he's working towards. He doesn't say it here, but he's saying, and theirs isn't. Theirs isn't. Pick it up in verse 11. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We're not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are sound in mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Paul is proud of his ministry because it serves God's purpose in bringing people to Christ. And they should be proud of him as well for doing this ministry. He reviews God's ultimate purpose and he reminds them that his ministry is in line with the purpose of God. Remember, I, you know, I'm not kind of going into every sentence what he's saying. I'm backing up and looking at the big picture argument here. He's comparing his ministry to theirs. Again here the implication is that Paul's ministry is in perfect accord with God's ministry and that is to reconcile people to God through Christ by the preaching of the gospel. He is happy and he is proud to do this and they should feel that way too, not the false teachers, the church. You should be proud of us, he says. We're doing God's work. We're doing God's work in God's way. We're living according to God's will. You should be proud of us, not, not, not trying to undercut us. Again, the implied comparison is that his ministry brings man and God together. Their ministry divides the brethren and also separates them from God. If you go back to trying to use the law to justify yourself, then you've fallen away from grace. If you think that not eating pork is going to make you pleasing to God, you, you've, you've lost it. If you think that 
being circumcised uh, will be the thing that saves your soul, then you've, you've not understood the gospel. That's what he's saying to them. Don't go back to that. And then in verse, uh, chapter six rather, he tells them that his ministry is sincere. He's not a liar. He says, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He doesn't say it right here, but in brackets he's saying, so don't go back, you've been saved, you're saved now, today, today. Don't, don't go back to not being saved. Don't go back to the things that have no power to give you the spirit. He goes on, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by uh, evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold, we live as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. He's talking about his ministry here. He's talking about himself. The idea is the world, the unbelievers have beaten me and kicked me and tried to kill me, but they have not succeeded. I'm alive in Christ. No matter what they do to my body is not going to change that. And the fact that he endures all of these hardships is another reason to demonstrate his sincerity. You know, if, I, if I didn't believe this stuff was true, I would have quit a long time ago. <laughs> the first time they decided to beat me for preaching the gospel, I would have you know, gotten a hint <laughs> and I would have left town. But no, he said, I persevered through all of it. Why? Because it's true. You, know, you ever hear that, that term, you, know, you, you drive by and whoops, there's an accident there, you know, and you're driving by and it's just human nature. You, know, you want to see what's going on and you happen to go by when it just happened and you look over and they haven't brought yet the body bags, they haven't you know, covered over, but there are perhaps dead people or people seriously injured and you see blood or whatever and you go, oh, I don't know why I looked at that. You know, like I cannot unsee that. It's pressed into your brain now. You, you, that image is there. You, know, you kind of regret that you even looked. Well, in the opposite way, Paul is saying, I have seen the Lord. I have understood the truth. I cannot unsee it. So beat me, whip me, shame me, do whatever you want to me. I, I, I can't unsee and unknow what I have seen and know. So not only did Paul preach, but he acted in such a way that his conduct supported and confirmed his message. Even though they suffered all forms of hardships and humiliation, they never did anything that would cause the brethren to doubt their sincerity, that there's no reason to begin now, he says. This may be a way for Paul to remind them of their conduct under duress and the conduct of these false teachers to see which one, by his conduct, proves to be sincere. So after having reviewed these six areas of ministry and comparison, Paul is going to finish the section with an exhortation to his listeners. He gives two exhortations. He begins one, he stops, and then gives a second, and then combines the two into one exhortation in order to finish the chapter. So the first exhortation begins in verse 11. Open your hearts. That's the first exhortation. Open your hearts. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart has opened wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. 
Now in a like exchange I speak as to children, open wide to us also. Open your hearts to me as an apostle is what he's saying. This is just an emotional plea that they be reconciled in fellowship and love with him. Somehow they've become his enemies. Why? Paul says that his love is not restrained. It is they that are holding back from loving and having fellowship with him. And then the second exhortation, do not be bound with unbelievers. He says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out of their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So the second exhortation is don't be bound or united to unbelievers. He was an ambassador for Christ, trying to bind them to himself, and through this, bind them to Christ, according to God's plan. That's what he was trying to do. And he encourages them not to unite or bind or yoke themselves with unbelievers who would take them away from Christ. Now, in context, Paul is referring to false teachers and other pagans in the church. He's saying to them, stay with the believers, stay with him. Don't join yourself to these false teachers. They're not believers, not true believers, because they're not preaching the truth. That's the contextual, that's, that's the, that is what he is talking about here. Okay? Now, the wider and general application of this verse can include business partners, friends, even marriage partners, because the principle remains true. What business does a believer have you know, yoking themselves with a non-believer? They were uniting themselves to false teachers and he tells them that they have no business doing this just like the temple doesn't belong with the temple of idols. In other words, the temple in Jerusalem does, has nothing to do with the temple of idols. And righteousness doesn't belong with lawlessness. As a general principle, this can be applied to mixed marriages, which I have seen done or heard you know, people teach on, but this is not the point in the passage. Paul is not talking about marriage here. He's talking about ministers. So you have to be careful when you're interpreting a passage. You have to interpret the passage uh, and, and, and arrive at the conclusion that Paul was arriving at for the people he was talking to. He's not talking about marriage here. He's talking about false teachers. Don't be bound up with false teachers. And then he makes examples. You know, you know, does the temple in Jerusalem, is it linked with, is it a sister temple to a, the temple of idols? No, he says. Does a believer, should he uh, willingly bind himself somehow to someone who doesn't believe? These two things don't go together. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, Paul talks about uh, if you know, the unbelieving partner in a marriage consents to live in peace, then let these two, you know, believer and unbeliever, let them remain married. It isn't the ideal, but God blesses the children of these marriages and reminds the believers that they have an opportunity to reach their partner so long as they're willing to remain. So it, Paul talks about marriage in 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he's talking about being united to unbelievers. You can make the application to marriage, but it's a secondary application, that's all, okay? The third exhortation let us all become united and holy. He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. 
We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I'm overflowing with joy in all of our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side. Conflicts without, fears within, but God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you. As he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, and so that I rejoiced even more. Remember two things I said at the beginning of my lesson? He changed his plans, you know, he wrote them a letter and he didn't visit right away. He wanted to see what they would do. That was one thing. And the other thing was he was traveling, he was trying to find Titus. He didn't know where Titus was. And here he says, I finally found Titus. Okay? And lo and behold, when I found him, Titus told me that you received my letter and that you responded to my letter positively. And so here he's saying, oh, that made me feel so good. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Here he's simply commenting on how they reacted to his first letter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. For this reason we have been comforted, and besides our comfort we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. Can you imagine it here? He's saying to both, I'm writing to these guys, I, I, I'm telling you they're going to be okay. I have confidence they're going to respond. And Titus may be saying, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's Corinth, you know, those people, they're, yeah, they're bad people. You know, maybe that was the conversation. And now he's saying, I finally met Titus. And he told me, yeah, they did respond. And Paul is saying, I told you. That's a, the cut down 21st century version of this, but Okay, one last section. His affection abounds all the more toward you, meaning Titus, towards the Corinthians, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice in, that in everything I have confidence, confidence in you. So let's all be united and holy. The final exhortation encourages them to receive his sincere love and affection and continue to pursue holy and pure living, which is one of the objectives of his ministry to them. He wants them to be united in love and holy in their conduct. In the balance of the chapter, he finishes the story about Titus that he began in chapter two, as I mentioned. This is a way of closing out this particular section of his letter in a natural and personal way. About Titus, he says, he was ill and depressed, but finally met up with Titus, who brought news of the reaction of the Corinthians to his first letter. He reviews how he felt about writing the letter in the first place and the joy he experienced when Titus reported their repentant attitude. He even recounts how Titus was excited about their great attitude and effort to change. And this leads him to a final word about how he rejoices with them and has confidence in them because of their change and their attitude. That's in verse 16. This ends the passage about ministry, the comparison of his and the one conducted by the false teachers. He ends on a positive note, assuming their good intention, and this sets the tone for the next subject, 
which will be fellowship. So Paul reviews his own ministry and sets it alongside the one being conducted by those who oppose him. He is saying to them, judge me by my works, not just by my words. And I think that's always a valid way to judge individuals, to determine their sincerity, not just ministers, but any brother or sisters, uh, sister. We are saved by faith, but we demonstrate the sincerity of our faith by our works, because faith wants to and rejoices in and is eager to work for the Lord. Okay, well, a little over time, I apologize for that. Uh, there's the reading assignment for next week. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses uh, 1 to chapter 9, verse 15. That's our lesson for today. Thank you very much for your extended attention. I appreciate it.